Good evening. We're going to get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, for our fifth and final lecture of our series. This is the fall series, as, as you know it. This is fall semester 2016. Uh, our topic tonight is dermatology. We start at 7, finish at 8.30. And for uh, the last time, I'd like to thank the Darien Library for hosting us this evening. Our format is one hour of presentation, followed by uh, 30 minutes of question and answers. Uh, as many of you know and have heard me introduce this program before, this is a collaborative effort between uh, the Darien Library, the Darien YMCA, and then Stanford Hospital uh, Physician Relations Department. So thank you for coming. My name is Josh Herbert. I am a primary care physician in Stanford, I am also the current president of the medical staff, and I'm the director of this series. So it's my privilege to introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Elizabeth Marsh is a dermatologist in Stanford. She has a very impressive resume. She earned her undergraduate degree at Princeton University and subsequently earned her medical degree at New York University School of Medicine. After completing medical school, Dr. Marsh completed her one-year internship in medicine at Yale New Haven Medical Center, followed by a residency in dermatology at Cornell Medical College, where she also served as chief resident. She has been in private practice for the past 15 years and is currently with the Dermatology Center of Stanford. She is on staff at both Greenwich and Stanford hospitals and is clinical, assistant clinical professor in the Department of Dermatology, Yale University School of Medicine, she also finds time to teach Yale Dermatology residents at the West Haven VA. My associate, who uh, my, one of my partners in practice, knows Liz from medical school and described her as the smartest student in their class. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Marsh. That was very nice. I don't know if I were, was the smartest kid in the class. That was very, very sweet. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight. It's nice to see you all here. I like talking about dermatology. I like teaching about it. And I'm also happy um, to entertain any and all of your questions. While I'm speaking, if you'd like to interrupt, ask a question, please do so. Sometimes it's a little bit more interesting if I hear what is on your mind or what you're curious about. But I'll get started. We're going to cover a lot of topics, actually, today. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about skin cancer. And then I'm going to talk about sunscreens. I know we're t going into the winter, so it's not exactly the first thing on everyone's mind. But I'd like you to know a little bit more about sunscreens than you might now. All sunscreens are not created equal. So I like to get into that a little bit. And then we'll end on a little cosmetic kick. Um, not too much, just a little bit basic things that we do in our office. So without any further ado, can you hear me? Is it OK? All right, so here we go. I work with um, three other dermatologists. I'm really so happy I have landed in this group that I'm working with. They're just all great, and we have a wonderful time together. Um, OK, skin cancers. There are different classes of skin cancers. We have basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers, which come um, from particular cells in the skin. And then we have melanoma, which comes from the pigment cell, called the melanocyte in the skin also. Uh, more than one million new cases of skin cancer will be diagnosed in the US this year. And basal cell and squamous cell are the two most common forms of skin cancer, but they are easily treated if detected early. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetime. Melanoma um, is the most common form of cancer for young adults. Is that true? Melanoma is the most common form of cancer for young adults 25 to 29 years old. Yeah, the five-year survival rate for people when we detect it early before it's spread to lymph nodes is very good. We have a good survival rate. Um, but as you may know or have heard, there, are, can, there can be melanomas that are quite aggressive and can be life-threatening. Um, so this is why we try to teach our patients about screening and things like that. So we're estimating that there'll be 132,000 new cases of melanoma worldwide in 2016. I think I prepared this last year. So we're going to focus for a moment on non-melanoma skin cancers. 
Basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers are the two that I will talk about, although there are some other types of more unusual skin cancers that are also non-melanoma skin cancer type. Um, basal cell and squamous cell, I think, come from some cells which are located in this level of the skin, the epidermis. The bottom level of the epidermis is called the basal cell layer. And when those cells go awry, they create basal cell skin cancer. In the middle of the epidermis, we have squamous cells. And when those cells go awry, it creates squamous cell skin cancer. And then studded throughout our skin, you can't really see it here, but we have little pigment, pigmented cells called melanocytes. And when those go awry, we get melanoma. So basal cell. Um, Basal cell accounts for the majority of the non-melanoma skin cancers, usually develops in the chronically sun-exposed areas of the skin, and it rarely, if ever, metastasizes. So it rarely spreads inside your body to cause any kind of problems. It's usually slow growing, but if you leave it untreated, it can keep growing and cause a lot of problems because the skin will bleed and get crusted and nodule, you'll, it can grow into a nodule. I have some pictures. I hope you guys... I hope you guys don't have sensitive, I have a couple of really good pictures. This is part of the fun about dermatology. So a nodular basal cell often found on the face, usually a pink pearly papule is how we describe it. Rolled borders, a little bit shiny. Something, if it starts to bleed, that's something that we want to know about. It can occur close to, yeah, very important structures such as the eye. Because remember, it occurs most often in sun-exposed areas, so the face is something that's very sun-exposed. Okay, here, you know, the, it's a little bit bright in this room, so it's a little hard to see the pictures, but. And basal cell, remember, doesn't spread inside your body, doesn't metastasize. Little blood vessels, pearly pink, basal cell skin cancer. It can be a superficial type, which almost just looks like a patch of dry skin. I have to warn you, you're all going to be very paranoid when you leave this lecture today. And some of you might come up to me and start like taking off parts of your clothing. Um, I'm used to that, though. So slowly growing superficial basal cell can bleed easily. A morpheiform basal cell is really tough. It can look like a little white scar. Squamous cell. So 20% of the non-melanoma skin cancers can be squamous cells. Um, they arrive from a different portion of the epidermis, as I pointed out earlier. It tends to be a little bit more aggressive. They can invade the tissues beneath the skin, and they can metastasize. They can spread to lymph nodes. Um, a squamous cell can kill you, or an aggressive, an aggressive squamous cell can. Usually, um, squamous cells rapidly growing on the head and neck in older Caucasian men. That is the demographic for who gets um, the most aggressive squamous cells. So typically on sun-exposed areas of the body can develop within scars or within long-term ulcers on the skin. Usually erythematous, that means reddish to flesh-colored plaque, may ulcerate, means it can get crusty and bleed. This is on the back of someone's hand. Oh, I think I have a bad one coming up. Ready? Oh, that wasn't even the bad one. Okay. Yeah, that's on the scalp. Squamous cells. So what leads up to a squamous cell? Sometimes you just get one all of a sudden, but there are some pre-skin cancers, which are the precursors to squamous cells. And pre, the pre-skin cancers are called actinic keratoses. The idea is that sun-damaged skin creates actinic keratoses, which are sort of like cells gone bad. And if those cells get a little bit more misbehaving, they do become a cancer, a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. That's in the topmost layers of the skin. And then if it gets a little bit more bit misbehaving, it becomes an invasive squamous cell. So the idea is that there's a continuum here. So if we catch things early and we treat the pre-skin cancers, we can prevent you from developing a squamous cell cancer. This is an example of some pre-skin cancers, little rough uh, like warty growths on the back of a hand or the forehead or the scalp, and you might be thinking, oh, it's dry skin, it's dry skin, it's dry skin. Oh, I like to pick it off. I just pick it off. I put moisturizer on, but it never goes away, or it goes away and it comes back. That, it has a gritty feeling. That can often be a pre-skin cancer called nectin keratosis. You can get it on your lips. 
from all those years of getting sunburns on your lips. So what are the risk factors for basal cells and squamous cells, non-melanoma skin cancers? UV light from exposure to sunlight and, goodness forbid, artificial tanning lamps. I'm not a fan. Um, different toxic substances. Tobacco smoking has been linked to squamous cell skin cancers. Certainly, um, certainly things that are touched up against the lip. People who use um, tobacco, uh, put it in the lip. Chewing tobacco. Chewing tobacco, thank you. That is a real um, risk factor for squamous cell carcinoma inside the mouth. Genetic predisposition, of course. We're all just related to where we came from. Skin type, fair skinned, and high levels of sun are at greatest risk, and men more than women. How do we make a diagnosis of skin cancer? Well, we take a history, we do a physical exam, we do a lot of full body skin exams in my office. And if we're concerned, um, besides looking at the skin, we'll palpate lymph nodes. Anything that looks suspicious should be biopsied, which is very easy to do in our office to do a shave biopsy or a punch biopsy. And how do we treat these type of skin cancers? Mostly with surgical techniques. There's something called electrodesiccation and curatage. We can just scrape and burn. While you're there in the office, it can take a few minutes. We numb the area up and scrape and burn to remove the um, tissue that is the cancerous tissue. We can cut it out. We can send you for a technique called Mohs surgery. Some of you may have heard of Mohs surgery. Has anyone heard of Mohs surgery? Yes. Yeah, so Mohs surgery is an interesting technique. The idea is to get rid of all the cancer but not cause too much damage to the skin, have the most cosmetically acceptable result. So Mohs surgeons are specially trained dermatologic surgeons. They cut out what, the, what they perceive to be the cancer and then look under the microscope right there while you are still there in the office and they determine if they have um, cleared the margins. And if it's clear, great, then they can stitch you up. If not, they do another small pass so that we're incrementally trying to clear the offending area. Cryotherapy is, is freezing. We freeze with liquid nitrogen and radiation therapy. Still do it. That's using radiation, actually, to basically burn and scar away a skin cancer. And who would we do that for and why? We would do that maybe a very elderly person who couldn't tolerate surgery. Um, that might be a method of treatment. Just turn the cancer into a scar. OK, this is the spray gun. This is a liquid nitrogen gun. If any of you have ever been to a dermatologist's office, you'll know we like walk around with those things, sort of like guns on a holster. And we're constantly pulling them out and spraying things. And I had a patient the other day who walked off with it. I was like, what? <laughs> But she is very jealous that I have this because she always needs stuff to be frozen. Um, medical therapies for treating non-melanoma skin cancers. There are creams. There are chemotherapeutic creams that we now use which help to um, stimulate your own immune system to fight against skin cancers. And we do use some creams. I don't know if you've ever heard of these names, Aldara, Fudex. These are topical creams that are quite effective and are FDA approved at treating superficial basal cell skin cancers. Um, but we sometimes have to use them to treat even melanomas. So this is Imiquimod Aldara, a topical cream that's frequently used, FDA approved for the treatment of pre-skin cancers and basal cell skin cancers, superficial type. We give instructions as to how long people use this for. OK, so to summarize, basal cell almost never metastasizes. So the reason we treat it is because we don't want it to keep growing. And oftentimes, it's on your face. Um, so that's the motivation for treating it, not because we're so concerned that it's going to spread inside your body. Although, of course, there are those very extremely rare, weird cases. Um, but in general, this is mostly just you got to get it taken care of. You don't have to lose too much sleep over this. A squamous cell can metastasize in approximately 2.5 to 5% of cases. Um, let's see, locally recurrent squamous cells have a 30% rate of metastasis and can quickly become life-threatening. So something that's been cut out comes back again, that's an aggressive tumor. 
and we want it gone. So squamous cells may need, they, I wouldn't say may, I think squamous cells need to be treated more aggressively than basal cells. I should take, change that. Now melanoma is a skin cancer that originates from the pigmented cells in the skin called melanocytes. We also have melanocytes in the eye and the central nervous system. Whenever I have a, melanoma, a patient who's had a history of melanoma, I always tell them at the end of the exam that I want to make sure that they are also being examined once a year by an ophthalmologist, a dentist, and for women, a gynecologist. Because all those surfaces, the mucosal surfaces of the mouth um, and the vaginal mucosa can in fact develop melanoma, and the eye can develop melanoma. So melanomas can appear de novo, that means out of the blue, a new appearing, what you think might be a mole or a growth, and it's a melanoma. Or a melanoma can appear within a pre-existing mole. So maybe it's a brown spot. Oh, your mother told you it was a beauty mark. So all your life you thought it was a beauty mark, and then you come to me, and I'm like, no, I'm concerned that could be a melanoma. So that's a little bit of a tough day. But that's why we tell you to pay attention to your moles, and I'm going to walk you through that now. So this is a better, it's projecting better. Melanocytes are the little pigmented cells that exist within the epidermis. And if they multiply without any regulation, they can turn into a melanoma. 1% of all skin cancer is melanoma. So very, the, the small, small proportion but it does account for the majority of the skin cancer deaths. Um, melanoma is increasing faster in females in this young age group. And we think that that has a lot to do with tanning salons. Okay. Tanning salons. There's been a huge increase in melanoma since the early 70s. Uh, a more rapid rate of increase than for any other cancer. However, the mortality rate, the number of people dying from it has remained stable. And we think that has to do with earlier detection. And certainly in the past seven years, I'd say, better treatment. We have um, immunologic medications now that are approved and are effective for treating metastatic melanoma. And we didn't have that even when I did my training Yesterday, no, it was 20 years ago, so <laughs> we've come a long way. Um, so again, uh, one reassuring fact and one reason that we do these screenings and we try to teach people is because if we catch melanomas early, your survival rate is really quite, quite, quite good. Five-year survival rate for people whose melanoma is detected and treated before it spreads to the lymph nodes is 98%. What are the causes for melanoma? Excessive exposure to light, UV radiation. We know that now. There are actually some studies um, that have proven the association, with the, the fact that light causes DNA damage, uh, thus stimulating melanoma. We used to speculate, but there have been some studies that are actually bearing this out. Genetic factors and immunologic system, uh, immune system deficiencies. When we are immunosuppressed, cancers proliferate. Risk factors for melanomas. Many moles. Um, if you have a lot of moles, there's actually a statistic that if you just have one mole that's called a dysplastic nevus, if you have one dysplastic nevus, that increases your risk for melanoma a slight amount. I think every person who comes into my office has a dysplastic nevus. So you have to take all this stuff with a grain of salt. but moles, that is a risk factor for melanoma. Family history, fair skin, Caucasian with fair skin is a slightly increased risk factor than a Caucasian with more olive Mediterranean skin. Red hair, blue eyes, green eyes, so light eyes tell me a lot about your risk factors and your sensitivity to the sun and your chance of skin cancer, all in your eye color. Prior history of any type of skin cancer slightly increases your risk for another skin cancer. Oh, tanning salons for sure. Um, and history of blistering sunburns. So if you have these moles, and I'm going to show you a picture of what a dysplastic nevus looks like, you do have a slightly increased risk versus the general population. 
uh, again, who's at highest risk, family history of melanoma, and family history of many moles called the dysplastic nevus sy syndrome. A dysplastic mole, what is it? It's a mole that's usually a little bit larger, um, a little bit variable in its color with some irregular borders. It's often on the back, but it can occur anywhere. Here's some pictures. Again, I don't know if you guys are seeing it this well, but these sort of oval, two-toned, looks like a fried egg. Family with history will increase, okay. Again, just going through the same things I just said. Light hair, light eyes, and freckling tendency. The interesting thing about red hair is you don't have to have red hair, but if you have a family member with red hair, then you have what's called the red hair gene, and the red hair gene does increase your risk a little bit. Childhood sun exposure appears to significantly influence the risk of skin cancer. Certainly, if you remember blistering sunburns as a child, that has an increased risk. Oops, sorry. Where am I? Okay. Sunburn and chronic tanning. Ozone depletion, we feel that that has enabled more UV radiation to penetrate and come down to us. So we think that it's the fact that there's a thinner ozone layer, not that the sun is any stronger. Indoor tanning. This is a big industry, and the American Academy of Dermatology has really been trying to um, educate the, the general public about indoor tanning. It's not safe. It increases the risk of melanoma. And a lot of, usually teenagers go there, they think that it's a good idea to get tan before the prom. They think it's a good idea to get a base tan before they go away on spring break. And I always tell my patients, I'd much rather you get some natural light outside because it seems that there's something to do with the bulbs being so close to the skin that creates the increased risk of melanoma. We've tried, the American Academy of Dermatology is trying to ban indoor tanning, certainly for minors under the age of 18, and they're trying to petition for labeling. So the same way cigarettes have warning labels on it, uh, there's quite a few states, I think, that now have to have la uh, warning signs within the, tanning, um, within the tanning place itself so that people at least see these signs. Because a lot of people don't realize this. They actually, there are people who think that going tanning is a healthy thing. You just have to teach and learn. Okay, so what I try to teach you, my patient, when you come in, I say you have to pay attention for anything new or changing. You have to actually look at things. And people are like, I don't want to look at things. That's why I come to see you. And I say, no, you have to look at stuff. Um, or get someone in your household to look at stuff. Any new or changing moles. And then there's something called the ABCDEs. Oops, I keep doing this. And then ugly duckling syndrome. I'll talk to you about that in a second. So ABCDEs. If you have a mole that's asymmetrical, if you fold it in half and one side doesn't slightly match the other side, that's more asymmetrical, a little more concerning. If the border is irregular, if the color is a very dark color, or if it's a color that doesn't match your colors. Like let's say all your moles are light brown and then something pink all of a sudden shows up. Well, that's weird, okay? So I want to see that. Um, or if every, all your moles are pink, because some people, redheads often have a lot of pink moles, and then you have something show up that's brown. That's unusual, so we need to see that. Diameter, we used to teach that if you have a mole that's bigger than the diameter of a pencil eraser, that's something that's more uh, concerning. And then evolving or erosion is E. Erosion means something starts to bleed. That's just not terrific. You need to come in if anything suddenly starts to bleed. Evolving, I think, is probably the most important thing. Something that's new or something that's changing. If you take home one message from all of this stuff that I'm throwing at you, it's just to know that if something's new or something's changing, you need to pay attention to that and bring it to our attention. Okay, so here's some pictures. This is asymmetry. So you can see, like, I mean, this is all, there's a darker spot here, a lighter spot here. It's got ragged borders, uh, border irregularity. So that's this top. That's not a nice oval pattern. Colors varied. We've got this depigmentation in the middle. Diameter, larger than six millimeters as a rule, the diameter of a pencil eraser. 
Here we have some comparisons, benign versus malignant. I mean, you get a sense. This is pretty regular, folded in half, one side matches the other side. Again, benign, malignant. Benign, malignant. Same thing. Okay, so A, B, C, D, E. The ugly duckling syndrome is what I just alluded to. If something doesn't match the rest of what you got, okay, something looks different to all the rest of your spots, I want to see that. We try to teach you to do a self-examination. That means look at yourself. Get a look under your arms. You have to look under your legs, the places that are hard to see. It's not easy. Take a mirror. Okay, early detection. We do advocate regular self-exams. Patients with high risk factors should have a complete skin exam done by a dermatologist. Anyone with changing or suspicious moles should have an exam as soon as possible. And if you have a history of melanoma, we uh, monthly self-exams and yearly or even every six month full body exams. How do we manage people who have skin cancers or who have a lot of moles? We do regular follow-ups. We start exams at young ages. We do complete exams. We take pictures. Everyone can take pictures nowadays. Everyone has, you know, most people have iPhones, smartphones that ha can take a picture. I tell my patients to take pictures of any moles that are in question, and then they have a special file that's their own moles. People are usually thrilled when I tell them to do that. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it's, it's the only objective way of following moles. Um, and sometimes it saves having to do a biopsy. But we do biopsy any that lesions that we're concerned about or anything that's changing. I do suggest on a yearly basis to my melanoma patients, optho, dental, and gynecology exams, sunscreen, which we're going to go into with greater details. And if a patient has a melanoma, I do want their primary family members. That means their children or their parents, their first degree relatives, have a slightly increased risk for melanoma. How to minimize risk. Minimize your sun exposure. Seek shade. Avoid tanning beds. Wear protective clothing. Put on SPF at least every two hours. That's the crazy thing. Sunscreen really only lasts for two hours. Um, we're going to talk about this a little more. I know it's not really realistic to expect people to be reapplying sunscreen every two hours. But if you realize, at least, that the, one of the main limitations of sunscreen is that it doesn't last that long, then you might at least understand why you got that raging sunburn in Florida because you only put the sunscreen on once at 8 o'clock in the morning. So it has to be reapplied. It doesn't, it's not like magic and protects you for forever. Um, the American Academy of Dermatology has a special seal that they are able to print on certain sunscreens that have been recognized as being very good sunscreens. Sunless tanners. I'm okay with sunless tanners. People always ask me that. But don't think for one second that because you have a fake tan that you're actually protected from the sun. You know, you're not. Just because you're falsely darker, you're not protected. Um, there's a little saying, check your birthday suit on your birthday, just to get you in the habit. Um, okay. Oh, this is the interesting thing. Legislation forbidding indoor tanning in young teens, so under the age of 16 or 18, has been ratified in 11 states. That's a big effort that's going on now. Sun protective clothing. Um, there's really good clothes out there now that has SPF in it. And if you think that like a white cotton t-shirt is protecting you, it's not. A white cotton t-shirt only gives you an SPF of six. So you're not always protected. Depending on the weave of the cloth you're, clothing you're wearing, you're not always protected from the sun. But there are these new clothings out there now that do give much better SPF protection. Coolibar is a company. And they make good stuff. It's like very sporty looking and it doesn't look weird. And sunglasses. I, I always tell my patients to use sunglasses. Um, let me see. Sunscreen. Okay. So we're going to change gears a little bit here and talk about sunscreens because 
as I said before, all sunscreens are not created equal, and you need to know just a little bit about sunscreens. So some people are like very worried to put sunscreen on because they're worried about the chemicals in it, and they wonder, does it really work, or is using sunscreens actually making me get skin cancer? They finally were able to prove uh, a study took place in Australia, and they, I think they compared people who definitely use sunscreen all the time with those who didn't, and then they were able to determine the number of skin cancers that people developed in each of those two groups, and they were able to show that there was a reduced incidence of skin cancer by a significant amount in the people who used sunscreen. Oops, sorry. Previously, we didn't have any like actual study that showed that. We were only able to say, well, let's look at certain places like Hawaii and Australia where more residents are using sunscreen. And we were able to track them over a certain number of years and determine that those places were, the people were developing fewer skin cancers. You know, Australia has a very strong uh, public awareness campaign because the majority of the population is very fair-skinned Caucasians who are getting fried in the sun. Um, so the rate of melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers is really high. So they predated us in the U.S. in terms of how they educated the, pu the public, and it's made a big difference. So light, you know, there's two different main wavelengths of light that affect us and affect our skin. We have UVA light, which causes aging of the skin and skin cancer, and we have UVB light, which causes burning. So you can remember A is aging and B is burning. And the thing is that different chemical sunscreens only block either UVA or UVB. So when I was a kid, you know, I'm growing up in the 70s and the sunscreens only blocked UVB, the copper tone that was around. The chemicals in it only blocked UVB. So what that meant was we could stay outside for a longer amount of time without getting burned. But we were getting UVA, which causes aging and skin cancer. So then you get the idea that uh, sunscreens cause skin cancer because they were permitting us to stay outside for a lot longer without burning, but we were exposed to something that could give us skin cancer. So as time went on and this realization came to pass, the sunscreens became more sophisticated and the different chemicals were added to sunscreens to provide us with more of a broad spectrum protection. So we need sunscreens that have chemicals that block both UVA and UVB light. And when we have chemicals or a grouping of chemicals, combination of chemicals that block UVA and UVB light, then we have a broad spectrum sunscreen. And that's what you need to be using. Okay, so SPF, this is funny, because this, you're all looking for SPF 30, if it's 50, oh, I'm gonna use 100. What does it mean? All SPF is talking about is how long you can stay outside without getting sunburned. SPF is actually not talking anything at all about how effective that cream is at protecting you against UVA, which causes skin cancer. This is just telling you how long you can stay outside without getting burned. Okay. Um, so it's a rating calculated based on the time it takes for the skin to develop a minimal sunburn with the application of a certain amount of sunscreen. And you have to realize that however they determine that in the lab, there's huge variability with what really happens to people in the world when they put it on. First of all, it's based on this amount of sunscreen, two cc's per centimeter squared. That's sort of a lot. Most people don't put that much on. So even though this, the SPF might be 30, that's only if you put a lot of sunscreen on, which most people don't do. So SPF is not a measure of the potential damage from UVA rays. There is currently no official rating for UVA protection, but a label that specifies broad spectrum protection is the best indication of UVA protection. You've gotta put your sunscreen on the right way. That means you have to put a lot on. For some reason they teach us that you need to put on a shot glass amount. I don't know why there's this like reference to a shot glass, but I guess they figure that everyone 
in the community understands what a shot glass is. So a shot glass amount of sunscreen. But if you have a baby or a child, you can use half a shot glass. Um, no longer can a sunscreen claim to be waterproof. It is only water resistant, okay? Um, they can't say it's waterproof or sweatproof, and they can't say that it provides instant protection because it doesn't. You're actually supposed, supposed to put sunscreen on 30 minutes before you go outside. We advocate that you should be using sunscreen every day on your sun-exposed skin. All exposed areas and lips too, reapply every two hours. Okay, I know it's not realistic, but you just have to understand. Because the irony of chemical-based sunscreens is that they degenerate when they're exposed to sun. So then they have to put more chemicals in to stabilize the chemicals that are protecting you from the sun. Okay, and you have to reapply after swimming. There's two different types of sunscreens. There's chemical sunscreens and there's physical sunscreens. Chemicals are what I've been alluding to. Physical blockers are mineral-based sunscreens that don't use chemicals. I actually prefer mineral-based sunscreens. Does anyone know what is in a physical-based sunscreen? Any ideas? Go ahead. Zinc, yeah. Zinc and titanium. So these are the ones that look whiter. Because these are minerals that have been pulverized. They've been broken down until they're little particles. Then you smear those particles on your body, and they're physically blocking the light. Versus a chemical, which through a chemical interaction is blocking the light. Um, okay. Chemical sunscreens. Okay. So I just want, here's some words, right? Here's some, here's some names. These are chemical-based sunscreens. Oxyl methacinamate, synoxate, oxyl salicylate. PAB is like off the market because too many people got allergic reactions to it. Oxybenzone. This is a very common chemical that you'll see when you start looking at your labels, which now you're going to do when you go home and look and see what you've got. Um, but these are chemical-based sunscreens. Different ones absorb different wavelengths of light. Some absorb UVA, some absorb UVB. Um, and then they have to put different chemicals in to stabilize them. But physical sunblocks, as I said before, are effective against both, I didn't say this before, but they block both UVA and UVB, so they provide broad spectrum protection. They are inert metals, sit on the skin, and are not absorbed, titanium and zinc. So when I have patients who come and say, but I don't want to put all those chemicals on my skin, then I, I agree. And I say, yeah, so then why don't you move in the direction of using a physical sunblock with titanium and zinc? Okay, I'm going to go through some stuff. I don't like sprays. I don't know if you like sprays. I don't like sprays because you're spraying most of it into the air. You're breathing it. It's not good for your lungs, and you're not really getting it on your skin. Um, so these are some questions that patients ask me. They ask, if using a higher SPF, does that really make a difference? That's one question. They ask if their makeup has a certain SPF in it, and then they use another SPF of sunscreen, do they get 21? So I'll just answer this one here. No, you don't. You get the highest number, and you've probably diluted it a little bit, okay? But that's where you're at. You're not, like, getting a cumulative effect. Do sunscreens expire? Yes, they do. Now the FDA requires three years stability at original strength. It's supposed to be marked on the crimp or on the bottles. That was not always the case. That was not always a requirement. And pharmacies did sell old, quote unquote, expired or inactive sunscreens, but that no longer, I don't think that happens anymore. Does a higher SPF really make a difference? Yes, it does. A higher SPF enables you to stay out longer without getting burned, but it is not a direct proportion, meaning See, this is what people say. I thought SPF higher than 15 doesn't work any better. I thought higher than 30 doesn't work any better. An SPF 2 screens 50% of the UVB burning light. A 15 screens 93%, but when you double and go from 15 to 30, it's just an incremental difference. So you are getting increased benefit with the higher numbers. But I would most be happy if you choose SPF 30, but reapply it more frequently than you already do. Controversial topics, vitamin D. People say, but I need to go outside for my like 20 minutes of vitamin D. My internist, my doctor told me to do that. 
As a dermatologist, we cannot advocate that you do that. We have to say you should take your vitamin D supplementation, put your sunscreen on, and enjoy yourself outside, but in a, um, a moderate way. Okay. So the sort of dermatology message is, used to be slip, slop, slap, slip on a shirt, slop on a sunscreen, and slap on a hat, based on the Australian public health campaign in the 80s. But now we also say wrap, wrap on your sunglasses. Um, so we do encourage, um, we try not to discourage physical activity or outdoor activity, but we do encourage sun protection. Oh, and this is me, and you can see like I'm really very covered up here. Look, I'm wearing a hat, I have sunglasses, like a long sleeve. I was in the Grand Canyon. Um, I have stuff about cosmetics to talk about, but let me just stop for a moment because I think that, I'm gonna turn it off of me though. I want to, okay, I'm gonna walk away from this for a second. I'm gonna hand out some sunscreens and I'm going to hand out a list of sunscreens that I recommend. Um, they, and it, if you read through it or take the time when you go home, you can see that I tell you where you can get some of these sunscreens. I, I have absolutely no interest with any of these companies, but I just think it's good for you to know and understand that all sunscreens are not created equal. There's chemical-based sunscreens and physical-based sunscreens. Um, I think that if you read some of my descriptions here, it will say, uh, talk about certain sunscreens that are chemical-free. And while not all are readily available in your local pharmacy, Amazon is a really good um, resource, okay? So you can take a look. You can ask me questions about this later. Yes. Thank you. Yes, question. I was told in terms of the impact of the amount of sunscreen, mm -hmm. is, which I found interesting was say, okay. if you picture a small bottle of sunscreen, you mentioned that in proper tone. Mm -hmm. Now we have lots of big Costco size ones, but the typical small bottle, um, a family of four should use the entire bottle in one day. Yeah. Yeah. Because oftentimes somebody will have that for the entire season. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, you know, so many people will say, I put the sunscreen on, but I got such a bad burn anyway. And it really has to do with how we're using it, how frequently we're using it, and how much we're using. Uh, and it's a pain. It's a little bit tedious, labor intensive, and that's where s some of the clothing comes into play. I didn't write that down, but Kula Bar is a good company. And, and, and the clothes are great. You know, if you have a long sleeve. Now I think some people, I don't know if it's golfers or bikers, are actually putting something on that covers their arms. It leaves the hands out. Who's, who's, there's some that's become like. You can buy them on REI. Yeah. And right. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's, there's definitely more acceptable stuff out there. Um, I will, yes, answer questions. Go ahead. When you apply sunscreen, do you apply it before your moisturizer or after your moisturizer and then, and then your makeup goes on top? That, it's a hard, that's a hard um, question. I don't think there's any exact rule. I think you probably want your sunscreen to be on last, the last thing you put on. But I also try to encourage people, try to find stuff that's all combined. Neutrogena Healthy Defense, that's a moisturizer with an SPF of 40 in it. So then you're getting your sunscreen and your moisturizer. There's plenty that are tinted, yeah, for, for a woman, yeah. So there's tinted ones. What about body? For, the body, yeah. for the body, I would put your moisturizer on first and, put, and I would put your sunscreen on top. Okay. Do you have other sunscreen questions? 
Yes, I think the sunscreen should be the last thing. But again, I try to get past that by getting people to use stuff that's combined. Because how many things can you really put on in the morning? I mean, it's, it's a lot. Yes. Correct. But if you look, there is definitely more products nowadays specially formulated for people prone to rosacea, specially formulated for people who are prone to acne. So there's, there's more variety. Mm -hmm. Like maybe before nine, work in the garden and maybe after three or four. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was like, don't take vitamin D, uh, mm -hmm. pap uh, you know, capsules. Only I do it like a after uh, daylight savings time in the winter. So I thought I had it all down pat. I said the last vitamin D level was optimal. And now I feel like <laughs> <laughs> I think that we, it's, it is smart to think about the day. Do you want to be going out and doing all your outdoor activities at high noon? No. Yeah, so we try and tell people to do their outdoor activities like in the earlier and the later parts. That's, but, I don't use sunscreen. but you don't use sunscreen. So I would, as a dermatologist, I have to encourage you to put your sunscreen on first thing in the morning and then you sort of have on your face, maybe your hands, your arms, on your sun exposed areas just to make that step. Yeah. Well, I do, I do if it's after 9 or 10, mm -hmm. not real early. Oh, not real early in the morning? Yeah, only so I get my vitamin D, then I'll put the sun Well, you're thinking morning. about it. You're do, you're, you're, at least it, it's, on your, it's in your consciousness. Okay. Yes? If you're using the zinc or one of these yeah. blockers, do you apply right. it differently? Because I would think you could block it, but if you miss a place, you're going to look like a zebra. So again, you know, the old-fashioned zinc is pretty onerous. You know, it's really thick, and you're going to look odd. Um, some of these companies, Elta, that's written down on that sheet of paper, um, MD Solar Sciences, they make chemical-free sunscreen, even Neutrogena, Neutrogena, anything that says pure screen by Neutrogena. They're making stuff that's much more cosmetically elegant and less obnoxious, really, because People don't want that thick white appearance. So they have made things be more uh, acceptable. Elta is a great company. You can find it on Amazon. MD Solar Sciences has its own website. It's written down there. And Neutrogena, that's in your CVS. Any more questions at this point? OK, so I will move on to a s different topic. OK. So uh, simple skin care to freshen, not frighten. I think that this is the uh, philosophy of the practitioners that I work with. We are really quite conserv conservative, and we, um, we work gently with our patients in terms of cosmetic um, procedures. And the most important thing, when someone says, what can I do for my skin? Well, the most important thing that you've got to do is you've got to start incorporating sunscreen to protect your skin, OK? So sunscreen, sunscreen, and sunscreen, sunscreen. And then after that, we can start talking about some of this stuff, Botox, lasers, fillers, PLS, sclerotherapy. So the goals of cosmetic procedures in our office as we see it, take the tiredness out, freshen. We're not changing people. We want to, people to stay under the radar, meaning we don't want your friends to say, oh, wow, <laughs> like, what did you just do? <laughs> um, we want people to say, oh, I think you must have gotten your hair cut. You know, just not realize really what's going on, but just think you look nice. Fix things that are not a normal part of aging. Require minimal to no downtime and be budget sensitive. Most of our patients who do cosmetic stuff with us, we've had as patients for a long time. And it's men, not just women. But there are people who've gotten a level of trust with us. And oftentimes, they'll say to me, I want this, I want this, I want this. And maybe I'll say, no, that's too much, or that's not appropriate. And then we meet at some common ground. Botox is great. I've been injecting Botox for like 20 some odd years. No. I know. They'll, 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 I mean, I, I inject it on myself. Yes, I do. But I have been injecting it into patients for that long. Before it was FDA approved. It's FDA approved now for the treatment of um, glabellar. That's the frown lines. Um, 
I think it's also approved for the treatment of the crow's feet. Those are our little lines out here. I think it's a very safe medication, and this is why. It's used at much higher doses for medical indications. It's injected into the esophagus. It's injected into the bladder. It's injected into the muscles of kids with cerebral palsy. It is used in a lot of different um, manners in a medical. Those in a medical. The other is you want to This is, OK. <laughs> so. For cosmetic reasons, which we use, the FDA-approved do dosing is 20 units. That's really small compared to the medical dosing. And um, it works. Doesn't last forever. Lasts for about three months. You go to a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you look at yourself each day and you say, oh my gosh, I look better today than I looked yesterday. So I love that because like, what else does that to you? Each day you're getting better looking. And then you sort of go back to you um, but it's pretty subtle. It can be, at least. It can be overdone. People can look like you took an iron and ironed their forehead. So there, we like to um, smooth things but preserve function so that people still have movement and that they look um, like themselves just a little better. What's a bunny? Bunny lines are by the nose, like little scrunches here. I think your most bang for your buck is the glabellar, the frown lines. Mine are very aggressive because my Botox is worn off um, and I haven't had time to do it again. But the glabellar is great. Your forehead works great. It pulls you up. It sort of broadens and breathens the brow. And this isn't women only. We have men coming into the office and they get their Botox and we're happy. They're happy. It is whatever you want to do. You can do it once and never do it again. You can do it every three months, um, you know, thir every three months without fail, as some people do. But as I tell my patients, it's what you want to do. There's no rules. Once you start, it doesn't mean you have to do this forever. You don't have to do anything. Okay, so this is just giving you, yeah? This is Botox, yep. Crinkling, not crinkling. You get rid of botulinum toxin. Botulinum is a toxin. It is absolutely a toxin. It is a neurotoxin. It affects the neuromuscular transmission and it causes a temporary paralysis. That is exactly what it does. And you know what it also does? It also impedes the sweat glands from functioning. So it has actually been FDA approved for the treatment of sweating. So there are people who are very tortured by the amount of perspiration that they have. And this has actually been FDA approved for the treatment of what's called hyperhidrosis. It absolutely works. It's quite amazing. It doesn't last forever, but very superficial little injections under your arms impede the um, release of perspiration from the apocrine glands. It's not permanent. It lasts for about six to eight months. It's actually covered by insurance. They don't want to pay for it, but they eventually do because it, it, it is the approved treatment for that condition. Glycolic peels. These are superficial type of chemical peels. This can help to smooth the skin, unblock the pores, even out pigmentation, and in theory, eliminate fine lines. We do very superficial glycolic peels in my office. There are different kind of chemical peels that are really deep and can have slightly more risk factors associated with them. But um, glycolic peels are a nice thing to do in series, so do once a month for a couple of months. But again, I'm not going to touch this or do this with people if they're not using sunscreen because you're not going to make any lasting improvement if you're going out and getting a lot of sun on your face. Lentigenes are brown spots that come from sun exposure. I don't know if you can really see this, but if you can, this person has a bunch of freckling here and the glycolic acid peels minimizes it. Melasma is brown pigmentation that often occurs with women, usually in pregnancy, or women who take an oral birth control pill in conjunction with light. It's also known as the mask of pregnancy. It's really hard to treat, but glycolic acid peels can be helpful. There's a different type of peel that we also do called trichloracetic acid peels, and these are a little bit um, more aggressive. 
The areas turn white when we paint it on, and then they peel off. This is a typical target, like a light brown patch. This is the kind of thing, though, that has to be really evaluated by us, because there is always the chance that something like this could be a skin cancer. So um, after evaluation, then we can treat this for cosmetic reasons. We have a laser in our office, which is called the Qterra laser. It functions at different, oops, wavelengths, which means that it has different targets. It can target blood vessels, and it can target brown spots. So we use it to treat blood vessels, oftentimes on the face, because people don't like having blood vessels on their face, or brown spots on the face. The back of the hand is a common location. People get tired of having these. There's lots of names people give this. They call them liver spots. They call them age spots. But I always tell people these are sun spots because your age, your, let's see, your hand is the same age as, let's say, your stomach or your butt. But you have all these brown spots here, which has been exposed to the sun versus the parts of your skin that haven't been exposed to the sun. So these are sunspots from sun exposure over the years. And they respond very nicely to the laser. We also use it beautifully, actually, to treat blood vessels on the face, these kind of uh, on the nose. It works great. It is almost like magic laser in certain cases. Um, what laser light does is it goes through the skin, it's absorbed by either the blood vessels or the pigment, and it damages the blood vessels or the pigment without causing damage to the surrounding skin. So your risk of scarring is really minimal. And we use it for changes that people experience on their neck, which are from long-term sun exposure, which causes redness and a ruddiness, which we call poikiloderma. It's great for blood vessels, which everyone gets as we get older, these little red spots. Some people are bothered by them. They're totally fine, but some people are bothered. And oftentimes, people will get a little red spot on the face that looks like it has streaming blood vessels towards it, and that's called a spider angioma. We see those on kids also, and they respond very well to the laser. Blood vessels on the lips. I just had a lady who came in, I treated her, and it was terrific, gone. The Clear and Brilliant laser is a type of Fraxel laser. This is more um, used for tone and texture of the skin. Uh, it is something that creates a very red, you'll be red like you have a sunburn, but there's really minimal downtime. You're sunburn red for one day. What this laser does is it goes through the skin and causes some damage at the dermal level. And damage to our skin makes our skin want to heal. And when we want to heal, we lay down new collagen. And as we get older and when we've been in the sun, we lose collagen. So in order to replace collagen, you could buy a, you know, a tub of some moisturizing cream that says it has collagen in it. And you could spend a lot of money on that, and that will do nothing. But some of these techniques, laser techniques, which cause a little bit of damage, which stimulates collagen production, that actually works. So we use the clear and brilliant laser. This is it. OK. And it hurts a little bit, so we do use a topical anesthetic. You can have redness for up to eight hours. Another laser that we use in our office is for hair removal. That's a lot of fun. It takes time. You got to keep doing it. We're fighting nature, but it makes people happy. Fillers are usually um, that we use in our office are hyaluronic acid. That's a naturally occurring substance found in our own skin. And we basically inject it into areas of volume loss. As we get older, we lose volume. So people are bothered by different things. They'll say, I don't like this. This makes me look negative. We can fill it. But I always tell people, it's not going to go away. It's just going to soften the area. These fillers are great. They last for about a year. They're FDA approved. 
you can have bruising. I walk through that. I walk through people, um, the side effects, the risks, and the benefits. But this is what's out there, filler, to try to revolumize different aspects of the face. Sclerotherapy is a nice treatment that we do for the treatment of leg veins. We just use a salty salt solution. It doesn't have chemicals in it. It's one of the oldest um, treatment methods for uh, spider veins. It's just saline. When you inject salty salt water into the leg veins, it irritates those little veins that you might have. It irritates them and it almost turns them into a scab under the surface of the skin. And then your body reabsorbs it. The chance of you having an allergic reaction to salty salt water is really almost zero because we have saline in our body. We have salty water in our body. So here's a picture. And I think that's it. That's it. Thank you. So if you have any further questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Yes? Do I use Kybella? Um, currently in our office, we are not doing that. We'll refer people out. That's a new treatment that's been FDA approved for the treatment of um, fat deposits under this area. And it actually dissolves the fat with some injections into the area. Yes? Winter. Yes. I mean, tone, the dog, the soap, or what you know, so I actually start putting, like, I mean, I, I usually start putting lotion on my body. Like Good. So I have lotion for you guys also. I brought I mean, some so moisturizer. Once a week? I mean, but just like No, every water. day. What's a, what's a, every what's day. A body for a guy? Just Couple like, of things. First of all, the same way I said all sunscreens are not created equal, all soaps are not created equal. You have to realize that soap is a chemical, um, it's a chemical constituent that is formulated to degrease, to dissolve oils and greases. So, greases, I don't know if that's a word. But as we get older, we don't make as much grease. So if we're using soaps, we're degreasing ourselves, and then we're going to be itchy. And then you're going to go to the dermatologist or your internist, and you're going to be like, I am so itchy. My back is so itchy. I am so itchy. Well, you can actually solve this problem just by changing your soap. So you have to use a non-soap, such as Dove or Dove Liquid Cleanser, because Dove is not a soap. When you're using all those good things like Ivory and Dial and Irish Spring, when people tell me they use Ivory, I like, I'm like, ah! I mean, because it was a really good marketing campaign with the little baby who was naked and they use ivory on that baby. But really, in real life, if you used ivory on that baby, that baby would be howling. You can't use, you have to just make a very small change and use Dove or Cetaphil liquid cleanser, which doesn't suds up and it doesn't lather and it doesn't foam. And then you'll say, but it doesn't suds up, it doesn't lather, it doesn't foam, I don't feel clean. You're perfectly clean. All the things that make things suds and lather or foam are chemicals. So you don't need those chemicals touching your skin. Go with Dove. Yeah, okay. And you have to moisturize every day after your shower. And I'm, Dove is good. Oh, tone is your summer soap? Yeah, but soap is soap. All right, as long as you're not itchy. If you start getting itchy and too dried out, then you have to go back to Dove. Yes. Sure. About, um, your hands yes. In the yes. Sort of hand the eczema, and this is, we are right in that time where it's starting, and it does hurt. So same thing. If you're using Purell, um, which has alcohol in it, that's really harsh on your hands. If you're washing your hands a lot, get a non-soap liquid cleanser, like Cetaphil liquid cleanser, and actually use that to wash your hands. You'll think it's weird, because you'll feel like, it's almost like you're washing your hands with a moisturizer, but it's okay. And then you have to put moisturizer on as frequently as possible, and all moisturizers are not created equal, okay? So people like Lubriderm. Well, Lubriderm's really watery. There's a high water content in it. Eucerin makes a lot of good stuff. Uh, Cetaphil, CeraVe. These are all, 
the other thing with your hands, what was I going to say? Oh, when you're driving in your car, don't let your hot air be blowing on your hands because you will put yourself into a bad eczema situation in a moment by doing that. Wear gloves. Wear gloves when you drive because that's where people are, that the hot air is blowing on their hands. Yes. Should people be discouraged from getting facial surgery or facelifts? Have, have you ever seen Jocelyn Wildenstein? <laughs> Um, yes, I've seen pictures, and I think that. Scary. I, yes, we're all entitled to our own opinions about things like that. I think that's a personal decision, and I think that um, I think it's a personal decision, and I hope that physicians are behaving in a in a very um, yeah, giving fair you know fair and balanced commentary as to uh, advice for people, but it. People are entitled to their own opinions. Yes. I don't know. It's all the rage. People love it. People are rubbing it all over their faces and their bodies. And it, coconut oil, you know, and you can cook with it too. So it serves a lot of purposes. Um, it's like the new hot thing. A couple of years ago, it was the argon oil. These oils don't really penetrate that well. These moisturizers that are on the market that have things like ceramides in them, they're sort of scientifically trying to penetrate and replace what we don't have enough of. You know, but they're chemicals. They're chemically created. So maybe you prefer using a natural product. There's probably, you know, there's arguments that can be made either way. Uh, foods that are better for skin and hair, I, I have to just say like a well-balanced diet, taking a multivitamin at a certain point. Yes. 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 Sure. You can get basal cell skin cancers like um, within the mucosal surface. You can get squamous cells within the mucosal surface. And um, so that, yes, number one, I think it's great also anti-aging if you protect yourself with broad spectrum uh, polarized light, I think. And I actually also think it's protective for cataracts if you protect yourself because I think that light exposure into a light eye can predispose to certain cataract formation. Yes, uh, lips. Eucerin has a one with SPF in it. Okay. Make it get mm -hmm. Yep. I like um, Aquaphor or Vaseline Petroleum Jelly more than the um, you know, processed sticks because there is a product called Phenol. And if you look at what you're putting on your lips and if it has Phenol, Phenol is actually a preservative and it's a drying agent. Okay, so I think Carmax, the little circle in a pot, has phenol in it. So there's the theory, um, there's the, the rumor when people say, oh, you use this stuff and it actually makes your lips drier. Well, if you're using the one that has phenol in it, th there's truth to that. Yes? Again, that's, that, that's the same, yes, I try to pay, when people have lip dermatitis and lip issues, I try to break them of their habit of whatever they're using and get them to use plain Vaseline petroleum jelly, Aquaphor, or Vani Ply, which is a very good ointment that doesn't have preservatives or fragrance or masking fragrance. Yeah. I, you know, makeup is like an unregulated frontier. Probably, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that um, makeups are not well regulated in the way that the FDA approves things for medications. So there's a lot of false claims that are made, and there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in your makeups. I try to pare people down, especially when they're having hypersensitivity reactions. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Like moisturizing, but is a physical blocker? Yes. Better, yes. If, um, 
you, if the labeling on the sunscreen says broad spectrum, then you are blocking UVA and UVB. Okay, so if that answers your questions. Uh, it doesn't have broad spectrum stamped on it. Um, zinc does block UVA and UVB. So if you're using a, a chemical-free, physical-based. As much as you can. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do, but yes, as often as you can. Like if you're a golfer and you're playing golf and you put sunscreen on in the morning and you think that's going to make it through the whole day, it's not. You know, you have to stop at around like 11 or 12 and do a reapplication. What about um, skin tags that people get as they get older? Mm -hmm. That, that's a cosmetic um, issue most of the time. Although they can get big, they can um, twist, they can look like little black ticks. People come in and think they have a tick on them, and they can even get infected. So most of the time it's a cosmetic issue. Sometimes it's a medical issue. But if you don't like them, we either freeze them with liquid nitrogen or we numb them up and snip them off. And they usually occur in areas of friction around the necks, under the arms, the groin, under the breasts. It's the friction of wearing clothes and rubbing. Yes. Um, you were talking about the Botox that doesn't yes. last um, that three months. Three months is basically. What about peels? Um, oh, peels, uh, that time, is that, that is a different concept. The idea with peels is that um, it's part of a, a regimen, and the regimen would be using sunscreen in the morning, maybe a prescription Retin-A at night, and then coming in and having peels, maybe doing three in a row once a month, a light glycolic acid peel, preferably in the winter months versus the summer. Okay. Facial, yep. Then you can put a sun, you can place a moisturizer with sunscreen on, Neutrogena Healthy Defense, available in CVS, oil of Olay with SPF in it, and out you go. Then you're great. It was sunny today, yeah, wasn't it sunny today? Car, I'm not like playing golf, I'm not. You're driving in your car, do you know you get UVA through your, your car windows? Yeah. And UVA, so you're not burning, but you're getting UVA. Even this time of year? Yeah, a beautiful day like today. I think it was nice. I was inside working, but it looked nice outside. Uh -huh. Okay, yes? What do you think of alveoline? Alveoline. What is alveoline? A cleanser. It's like Noxema type of cleanser? It's like Vaseline. I don't know what's in it. I don't know what it's made of. It's like Crisco. I'm almost thinking it's like Crisco. You know, we used to use Crisco on people as a moisturizer. I don't know. I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. Yes? Yes. Sock. There's a new, um, new over-the-counter moisturizer called Excipial, E-X-C-I-P-I-A-L. It's in CVS. You know, it's in CVS. It has um, ureic acid in it, which dissolves dead skin. It's great for your feet. Excipial. E X. C-I-P-I-A-L, 10% or 20%, it's in CVS, and it dissolves the um, dead skin. So it's very good for the feet. You can wear it with the sock. You can wear it with the sock, or not. <laughs> it does, and they have one that's specifically marketed for hands. I think that's the 10% one, and then the 20% one is for the feet. Yes. Yes. Well, again, it's a multi-pronged approach. Sunscreen in the morning. I would probably also suggest that you use Retin A, which is tretinoin, vitamin A-based medication. Requires a prescription. Helps to fade brown spots. Also helps to create collagen. And then laser for some some brown spots. Once it's evaluated, yes, laser can be effective. Or sometimes even liquid nitrogen. Just freeze the area with liquid nitrogen. Very easy, very simple, very old fashioned. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.